Before you can start talking about the cache, there are two points you need to understand about DDR memory. The first is that DDR has a minimal transaction length. You can write a single byte to DDR memory, but it will be no faster than writing 16. The other is that DDR is not exactly random access. Reading or writing sequentially is very fast, but reading in random order requires a certain setup operation before each read. As such, we want the CPU's transactions with the memory to be as big and as sequential as possible. The way to achieve that is to introduce a moderating component between the CPU and the memory. This is the cache. Cache is composed of fast and truly random access memory. There is a trade-off, of course. Being fast and truly random access means it is also much more expensive than DDR. The solution is simple. We have less of it. For our project, we're using the QMTech FPGA development board. It has 256 megabytes of DDR3 memory, which costs about $8. For the fast memory, we're using the memory inside the FPGA itself. The Spartan 7S15 has 40 kilobyte of block RAM, which we can use as 10 blocks of 4 kilobyte each. The RISC-V CPU uses one block, so we have 36 kilobyte we can use as cache. For reasons that will become obvious in a moment, we can only use memory sizes that are powers of 2. So let's assume our cache is 32 kilobyte. The first thing we need to decide is the cache granularity. As I said before, DDR has an inherent minimal access unit. It makes no sense to have the cache access the DDR in smaller units than that. As such, we leave all fine-grained accesses as something that happens between the CPU and the cache. The cache-to-memory interface has fixed-size accesses. Since our DDR's inherent access size is 16 bytes, that's what will set the cache storage unit to be. Each such storage unit is called a cache line. So our cache line size is 16 bytes. It's rather small compared to, say, what Intel uses for their CPUs, but then again, we're dealing with a lot less memory. One immediate implication of this is that the bottom four bits of the address are no longer interesting to us. They only serve to determine which data inside the cache line we need. As far as cache lookups go, we can simply ignore them. I implemented this as another module called Bus with Adjuster. You input 32-bit access through one end and get 128-bit or 16-byte access on the other. This component is trivially adjustable to also support an 8 to 128-bit adjuster for the 6502. This way we can use the same cache for both 32 and 8-bit CPUs. So now when we want to read the memory, we first check that the memory exists in the cache. That sentence is not as simple as it sounds. To understand why, let's see how a software cache would probably be implemented. In software, we'd probably implement a hash table mapping addresses to cache lines. Once a request comes in, we strip the bottom four bits and check the rest in the hash table. If it's found, we return the value from the cache memory. With this design, any cache line can be used to cache any address. In other words, we can associate any address to any cache line. This design is called fully associative and is not impossible to implement in hardware. On the other end of the scale is the non-associative design. Each address has one and only one cache line it can go to. This greatly simplifies the management logic. Once we get a request, we don't have to look for the correct cache line. The correct cache line is obvious from the address. All we have to do is check whether the data currently there belongs to the correct address called a cache hit, or not, called a cache miss. So now we can split the address bits into three categories. The whole memory is 256 megabyte, meaning we need 28 bits to specify an address. Of those 28 bits, the four least significant bits specify the intra cache line byte. The next set of bits are the cache line address. They name which cache line is to be used if our cache is 32 kilobyte, the cache line address is 11 bits, giving us 2048 cache lines. This is also the reason our cache's size needs to be a power of 2. If it wasn't, we need to take a module, an operation that is too expensive to implement practically. This leaves us 13 bits that are the memory address, the cache line's address within the memory. One thing is fairly obvious from this point. 
In order to manage cache, in addition to the actual memory for the cache data, we also need memory to manage the metadata. In our case, we need one bit to indicate whether the cache line contains any data at all, 13 bits indicating the memory address of the cache line, and one more bit called dirty. Here's the thing. When the CPU performs a write, we do not immediately perform this write to the DDR. Instead, we just store the updated data in the cache. At some point in the future, the same cache line will likely be needed for some other address. Before we can fetch that new data into the cache, we must first flush the data stored in the cache but not the memory to the DDR. To keep track of whether that's necessary, we use the dirty flag. So this is our cache's state machine. When a request comes in, we immediately fetch both the cache line and its metadata. If the address memory bits match the cache line's metadata memory address, in other words, if this is a cache hit, we simply return the data if it's a read. If this is a write, we write the data to the relevant bytes in the cache line and mark it as dirty. This means, and this is important, that cache hits finish with zero delay. If the CPU accesses cache data, it is as fast as accessing data in static RAM. In the interest of full disclosure, I did have to slow the CPU down from 100 MHz to 75 MHz for this to actually work. Even so, this is still a huge win. If this is a cache miss, we first check whether the cache line is initialized and dirty. If it is, we perform a flush. We write the entire cache line's content to memory. Next, we need to perform a fetch. This means reading the data from the correct memory address into the cache line. At this point, we update the cache line's metadata as initialized, pointing to the correct memory address and clean. Now, if the original operation was a read, we can return the data. If it was a write, we can update the cache data and mark the cache line dirty. This all sounds nice and dandy. There's just one complication having to do with using the FPGA's BRAM as cache. Up until now, we've used the BRAM as dedicated static memory that was initialized with the startup code. This is of particular importance as the DDR does not retain its data across power cycles. Even if it did, we need quite a bit of code to initialize the controller and DDR itself before we can start using it. That code needs to reside somewhere. In other words, we no longer have where to place the boot code. I guess I could have set some BRAM aside for the startup code. The problem with that is that BRAM is not a resource available in abundance. Putting the startup code in dedicated static RAM means less cache, which will hurt performance well past the initial boot stage. The solution was this. The build system takes the boot ROM and loads it into the BRAM. It then sets the cache's metadata to view the cache as initialized and dirty. As far as the CPU is concerned, the machine comes up with the code already in RAM. Of course, it's not actually in RAM, it's in the cache. However, if the CPU ever needs to evict it, the fact that it's marked as dirty will cause the cache to write it out to DDR first. In other words, the DDR may come up uninitialized, but by the time we run stuff, the boot code is written to the DDR by the cache mechanism. So long as we take care not to have any cache misses before we finish initializing the DDR, which we can do simply by limiting all accesses to the first 32 kilobyte of memory, we can run just on static memory. We now have a fully running 32-bit computer. Next, we need to complete the boot process by loading the bulk of the code from Flash. Once we do that, we can finally start integrating our 32-bit and 8-bit computers into a single design running concurrently. Until then, thank you for watching.